breaking tonight. A renewed cry to quote. Those chants, once a staple of President Trump's 2016 campaign, are taking on new life tonight in the wake of yet another revelation that Hillary Clinton's inner circle mishandled classified information while in power at the White House. And surprise, surprise, Hillary and her closest friend got a pass. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sandra Smith in for Martha McCallum tonight. Earlier today, the president slammed longtime Clinton aide Huma Abedin, suggesting she be jailed following the release of a trove of emails from Abedin's personal devices and revelations that several were marked classified. Trump tweeting, quote, she put classified passwords into the hands of foreign agents. Remember sailors' pictures on submarine? Jail. Deep State Justice Department must finally act. The president referring to former Navy sailor Christian Saucier, jailed in 2016 for taking classified photos of a ship. Critics called it a double standard. Both Clinton and Saucier were accused of mishandling classified information. Both were put under investigation by the FBI, but Hillary Clinton was cleared and Saucier was sent to prison for what many consider to be a far lesser offense. In moments, that sailor, Christian Saucier, joins us for an exclusive reaction to these new developments, and he has a lot to say. But first, Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge is live in Washington tonight with the latest fallout. Catherine, good evening. Thanks, Sandra. Newly released emails show Clinton aide Huma Abedin sent security passwords for sensitive government networks to her unsecured Yahoo account. In a tweet today, President Trump unloaded on Abedin, alleging she disregarded basic security, put classified passwords at risk, and he suggested she should be jailed and once again criticized what he calls the deep state Justice Department, imploring officials to finally act against Abedin, former FBI Director Comey, and others. At the State Department briefing, spokeswoman Sarah Sanders was pressed on the president's deep state allegations. Obviously, he doesn't believe the entire uh, Justice Department is part of that. You know, one of the things that the president has done is uh, appoint Christopher Wray at the FBI because he wants to change the culture of that agency, and he thinks he's the right person to do that. In her April 2016 FBI interview overseen by demoted agent Peter Strzok, who sent anti-Trump text messages, Abedin admitted she routinely forwarded government emails to her Yahoo account for printing. Abedin says she was not sure her Yahoo account had ever been compromised, despite receiving a warning. Those government emails found on her estranged husband Anthony Weiner's computer are significant because they led the FBI to reopen the criminal case 10 days before the election. Abedin was never charged with any crime, Sandra. All right, Catherine Herridge, thank you. You're welcome. Well, the president's tweet triggering fresh calls from lawmakers to reexamine why Hillary Clinton and those around her seem to be getting a free pass for their reckless handling of classified materials, while others are paying dearly for what they say are similar, even lesser offenses. Listen. There was a, a sailor who took a picture on a submarine. You know, that is, I'm a Navy guy. That stuff is classified. You're not supposed to do that. He shouldn't have done it. But you know, he ends up going to, to federal prison for that, where you look at what Huma did, you look at what Hillary did, with how they had all this classified information on these unclassified servers and computers, and yet none of them were held accountable. Here now in an exclusive interview is that former Navy machinist you just heard Congressman DeSantis talking about, Christian Saucier. Christian, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me on, Sandra. What was that like this morning to see your story brought up in that tweet by the president again? Well, I mean, it's good because I think he's pointing out some serious issues that the FBI and the DOJ under Comey and Andrew McCabe you know, I mean, these are the same guys who were investigating me at the same time they were supposedly investigating Hillary Clinton and uh, her cronies. And, you know, they couldn't wait to exonerate them before they'd even conducted interviews, whereas they jumped, you know, were chomping at the bit to destroy my life, which is exactly what they did. To you know, be clear, they, Christian, and I think this is important to get this out here, you took responsibility for your actions. You owned it. You, uh, you pled guilty. And then you served time. Correct. So it's, it's a double standard that you oh, you yeah. say you believe exists. Oh yeah, I mean these politicians, Hillary Clinton, a prime example, she denied and denied and denied it until finally she got caught red-handed and said, okay, I did it, what's the big deal basically? Well, the big deal is, is, is she did exactly what they accused me of doing and what I pled guilty and took responsibility to. I didn't go to trial. I 
basically I took secured information, the my, pictures of my submarine, and put it on an unsecured device, my cell phone. That's what I got charged with, unlawful retention of national defense information. And Christian, which, and, by and, the way, is exactly And also exactly to point out, you're still did. under house arrest, right? I mean, you still got an ankle bracelet on. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, I, I did a year in federal prison. I got six months of house arrest and three years of federal probation. Plus, I'm a felon and I have another than honorable discharge. So I lost all my VA disability benefits, uh, you know, my veteran status, everything after 11 years in the service and, uh, you know, two deployments to the Middle East. I, I, I have nothing. You know, it's it's very difficult for me watching as, you know, this very same FBI that was supposedly, you know, protecting us from people that well, mishandle classified information. Well, that's what they said was my case, that they needed to set an example. Well, why aren't they setting an example of this egregious violation that Hillary Clinton and Huma Abedin and Cheryl Mills did? They had top secret SCI, which is the highest level. I had confidential pictures, you know, which, you know, I'm not trying to minimize what I did. I made a mistake, and that's why I took responsibility. But I've been contacted by numerous people in the military after this happened, and they said, you know, from Vietnam up to current day, and said, well, gosh, I took pictures of where I worked, you know, and it was probably top secret or something, but I wanted to have mementos of my time in service. And I said, well, you know, that's honestly, that's what a lot of people do, and that's what I did. Um, you know, but it just so happened that my case was fortuitous for them to prosecute so that they could take the so, heat off Hillary Clinton. Now, what happens What happens next with the president bringing, bringing you and your situation up in this tweet this morning? I know you had had hopes that um, if President Trump would possibly pardon you or relook at your case, he hasn't done that. Uh, do you still have hopes that he may? Well, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that he'll he'll look at this case and say, look, this sailor, you know, me, I, I've been, my family and I have been put to the ringer. We've been punished enough. You know, um, we've lost everything. Our house is in foreclosure. You know, we got bill collectors from all the legal debts calling all the time. Um, you know, what, what more can they do to us? I, I think he needs to send a clear message to the DOJ under the Obama administration that what they did to us was far to the, you know, extreme. And uh, he needs to send the same message to Hillary Clinton and them and say, look, you need to get prosecuted. And this guy here, he he shouldn't be a felon anymore. You know, I, I it's difficult. It's 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 such an uphill battle being a felon and trying to get a job and and trying to assimilate back into society. So, um, what based yeah. on what we just learned with Huma Abedin and this this latest email release, what do you think should happen to her? Should she see jail I, time? I think she should be prosecuted. You know, I, I it's neither here nor there whether she should see jail time. That's what a, a you know a. A grand jury and what a you know a, a jury of her peers say, but she should be prosecuted. She should be put through the same legal system that went after me. Unfortunately, I didn't have near the legal resources that she does or Hillary Clinton does, so they'll be able to mount a much better defense than I could. But even still, they should still well, be charged I, the same as me. I know it, and as you just detailed to us here, that this has been extremely uh, painful to your family. I know you have a young daughter at home as well. We'll continue to follow your story, Christian. Thank you so much, and thank you for following it. Thanks for coming on. Also tonight, yet another case of Hillary Clinton potentially receiving a special treatment of sorts, this time from the media. WikiLeaks releasing emails between the Clinton State Department and the New York Times, showing the paper feeding the Clinton team information about stories they'd be publishing days before the stories hit newsstands. My next guest says this type of, quote, collusion by the Clintons doesn't shock him. Gary Byrne is a former Secret Service agent who protected President Bill Clinton in his new book, Secrets of the Secret Service. He claims Bill and Hillary Clinton, quote, syst systematically broke the rules, and he says America deserves to know the real Hillary Clinton. And we thank you for coming on the program thank you. this evening. So who is the real Hillary Clinton as you saw and got to know her? The, the real Hillary Clinton, as I detail in my book, uh, Secrets of the Secret Service, is the, the Hillary Clinton that uh, doesn't follow the rules. The story that you just heard this gentleman before me talk about, he's exactly right. There's two sets of rules. There's the rules for everybody else, and then there's rules for the Clintons. We saw this many a times during the campaign. Um, um, ma um, Mrs. Clinton was fed uh, information from CNN. Uh, you just stated a, a fact that uh, they were fed information from, from the news media. I wrote my book, Secret of the Secret Service, to, to get the truth out, that the Secret Service has been compromised, and one of the ways it's been compromised is by the, Clinton, the former Clinton administration and Mrs. Clinton. And that, you say, is posing a serious threat and a serious, it's a serious danger to the current president. It, it absolutely, it, to the serious president and to, to other protectees. Uh, who in their right mind thinks that during the campaign 
that riding around in that van that we saw her riding around in is, is a secure mode of transportation. That van is set up for a certain reason because she asked for it. That's not what the Secret Service moves people around in. It's not armored correctly, and it, it cannot ram vehicles out of the way. She's risking those agents' life and her own life. She has turned the Secret Service basically into arm Uber. That's what they are now. I mean, give us some more specific examples as to how they have completely, as you put it in your book, changed the quality and significantly lowered the quality of the Secret Service as we know it today. So going back to President Bill Clinton's administration, the first thing they did when they got in there is they reduced the way we screen people. The Secret Service and the FBI had a system set up where they would screen employees that the, that the current administration wanted to bring in. And the first thing they did was take that apart because a lot of their employees had criminal records. And we, they ended up being hired, any, hired anyway. One of the, the worst things that happened there is during the, the time the Clintons were there, um, Vince Foster, uh, a lawyer for Mrs. Clinton, took his own life, committed suicide. As soon as the FBI found out about it, they contacted the Secret Service and asked them to put a, a, a uniform division officer on um, Vince Foster's office. As soon as he was posted, Maggie Williams, Mrs. Clinton's chief of staff, this is significant, Mrs. Clinton's chief of staff shows up, bullies her way inside there, takes files out against, you know, she broke a crime scene etiquette, basically, and then took the files back and, and then lied in a grand jury and said that she didn't know anything about it. Two to three years later, those same files showed up in Mrs. Clinton's private living court. Based on your account of what you saw inside closed doors happening with the Clintons, why do you think that they have been able to get away with this for so long, living by this other Be set of Because rules. they slowly compromise and corrupt everybody. They started with the Secret Service and the FBI when Bill Clinton first got in the office. There were 900 FBI files found in the Clinton White House that came from the, from the FBI. And they were, they were background files, for instance, like when you apply to the government or the FBI has done an investigation on you, they have these files on you. It's called raw data files. 900 of those files were found in the Clinton uh, complex. And nobody knew how they got there. And I can tell you exactly how they got there. A guy, uh, the Clinton's um, security guy that they hired, um, his name slipped my mind, but uh, right. it'll come back to me in a minute. Um, he asked the FBI uh, person at the time to get these files for him, and they refused to do it. So he picked up the phone, he called somebody senior, and 900 FBI files ended up in the Clinton White House. It was another scandal, one of many scandals. I, we see the Secret Service come in all the time. When yes. We guests here at Fox News. We have so much respect for, yes, for the work they people. do in protecting, uh, protecting our, our president, quite frankly, um, as well as senators and congressmen, all of these people, and we know that it is a hard job. It is. Do you get the idea that President Trump understands what has happened with the Secret Service, and does he see the need for change? I think he understands that they're under a lot of pressure, but I think there's a lot of things he doesn't know. For instance, there are 1,300 uniformed division officers like I was that work at the White House and the Foreign Missions Branch right, right now. Out of those 1,300 officers, in the next three to five years, 1,100 of them can retire. They can leave in three to five years. They are so overworked. Their average salary is seventy to hundred thousand dollars a year. Some of these guys and men and women are making more than the Secretary of Homeland Security because they're working them twelve hours a day, seven days a week. I think he knows that. I think he knows it needs to be uh, fixed. But the problem is, is that the director that he appointed, I'm sure he's a good man. He's a former Marine Corps general. But all the information he is getting is from the people in the Secret Service that w the made men and women that want to keep the Secret Service in the way it, the way it is now. And he's not getting the truth. So is it fair to say the double standard that we just spoke about with Christian that he says he's feeling right now is something you you believe you saw firsthand? No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's just incredible the amount of corruption that took place during the Clinton's administration. And the Secret Service had problems to start with before that. All right. Great to get your take on things. Gary Byrne, thank you for being thank here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. All right. In the book, we will read it. The name, Secrets of the Secret Service. I already made it through the first chapter. Thank you. And it is an interesting one. All right. Thank you for being here tonight. As protests rage in Iran, President Trump does something his predecessors would not dare. He takes a side. And this veteran, wounded by an Iranian bomb, says it's about time. He joins us live exclusively next. An Iranian bomb killed me in 2005, and by the grace of God and great medics, I came back to life three times. Even the New York Times, which is totally dishonest, by the way. Here's the good news about the New York Times. They won't be in business much longer. Do you see what they're losing? 
President Trump issuing a rare congratulations to the New York Times along with a challenge for 2018. In an early morning tweet, the president wrote, the failing New York Times is a new publisher, A.G. Sulzberger. Congratulations. Here is a last chance for the Times to fulfill the vision of its founder to give the news impartially without fear or favor, regardless of party, sect or interest involved. But it looks like the Times is off to a rough start with critics attacking a weekend expose on the Trump-Russia investigation, calling it nothing more than a desperate attempt to bring the collusion narrative back from the dead. Fox's Doug McElway is live in Washington with this story. Doug, good evening. Good evening to you, Sandra. It is no secret that one of President Trump's most uh, uh, notorious uh, enemies has been what he calls the failing New York Times. And after that tweet, which you just put up on the screen, uh, he pointed out to this other New York Times story, a blockbuster story, which it was first uh, publishing over uh, Saturday, which hints at this. The Times story said, and I quote directly from it, during a night of heavy drinking at an upscale London bar in May 2016, George Papadopoulos, a young foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, made a startling revelation to Australia's top diplomat in Britain. Russia had political dirt on Hillary Clinton. Well, the Times story then goes on into more detail, quoting, How much Mr. Papadopoulos said that night at the Kensington Wine Rooms with the Australian Alexander Downer is unclear. But two months later, when leaked Democratic emails began appearing online, Australian officials passed the information about Mr. Papadopoulos to their American counterparts, according to four current and four Amer former American and foreign officials with direct knowledge of the Australian's role. Well, Mr. Trump is not the only one to question uh, yet another New York Times anonymously sourced, entirely anonymously sourced story. Also, uh, former federal prosecutor Andrew McCarthy, writing in the National Review, calls the Times story Russian collusion 2.0. He says that back in April, the Times had a similar blockbuster story of collusion, but blamed it on another Trump campaign staffer, Carter Page. He wrote, McCarthy did, Back then, no fewer than six of the Times' top reporters, along with a researcher, worked their anonymous current and former law enforcement and intelligence officials in order to generate the page blockbuster. Now, Trump, in his argument with the New York Times, may be scoring some points, at least among people who uh, approve of Mr. Trump's behavior in this regard, if only in the sense that the most common sense dictates that people will say something anonymously that they will not say on the record. And this battle with the New York Times and other members of the mainstream media is not likely to end until Mr. Mueller and the special prosecutor's office comes down with an indictment of the president of the United States or if it clears the president of the United States. Sandra, back to you. All right, Doug McElway, thank you at the mm -hmm. White House for us tonight. So why is the New York Times so Interested in George Papadopoulos now? Well, in a new op-ed on foxnews.com, former CIA agent and Democrat Brian Dean Wright states, if this journalistic whiplash seems incredibly suspicious, it should. The time sleight of hand from dossier to Papadopoulos is a thinly veiled effort to keep the allegations of collusion alive in the face of Trump's demand for the witch hunt to come to an end. Here now is Ari Fleischer, former White House press secretary under President George W. Bush and Fox News contributor. And Ari, happy new year to you. Always good to see you. Happy new year. So what do you make then of the New York Times offering up this new explanation behind all of this? Yeah, I mean, the amount of ink that has been spilled on collusion with no evidence of collusion is staggering. Um, you know, I understand, and if anybody in the Trump campaign did engage in collusion with Russia to hack the DNC or John Podesta's emails, they deserve whatever is coming to them. But we've seen no evidence that anybody did that. So instead, you just are getting this giant wave of story after story about why is the FBI investigating Trump, and the reasons keep changing. And I think it's because there's just such a desperation to attach the word collusion to Trump that anonymous sources just get passed onto the front page, even if they contradict previous New York Times front You know, to, to dig a little bit further in the National Review's a piece, Andrew McCarthy uh, writes on the New York Times report uh, on Papadopoulos, now with the page foundation of the collusion narrative collapsing and with the heat on over the Obama administration use of the dossier, it is apparently Papadopoulos to the rescue. So to your point, Ari, it really just seems like they're grabbing at anything they can here. Well, it kind of reminds me of Tarzan swinging through a jungle, just grabbing vines. But in this type, he keeps yelling collusion when there is none. 
you know, it started out with the dossier and the Democrats demanded investigation dossier. And then you had, as was pointed out, Carter Page was the reason the FBI began its investigation because he took a trip to Moscow. And now you see it's George Papadopoulos because he was drunk in a bar. You know, those are the three vines, but none of them prove anything Quite about frankly, Columbia. I find it difficult to keep track of it all, Ari. <laughs> and I'm sure our viewers do too. There's, there's a well, lot to this. Yeah, go ahead. And, and that's why the heart of the matter, the only thing that counts is did Donald Trump or his campaign collude with Russia? And suffice it to say, if anybody did cooperate with an enemy to influence an American election, they deserve to be prosecuted. You don't do that in this country if that is a crime. But if it's not a crime, it certainly is immoral. And but we see no evidence. It would have leaked by now if we had heard people had done that. Because keep in mind, now we're talking about events are now almost two years old. And none of that has come out. It hasn't come out from Capitol Hill. It hasn't come out from the FBI. It's come out from nowhere, probably because it doesn't exist. And clearly, by the look of the president's recent tweets on this, he's, he's choosing to pick another fight with not just the media, but specifically the New York Times here. And Ari, you and I have talked a lot about this. You know, is, is the president's strategy to go after them, is it working? Well, look, I, I've made a point of saying the president sometimes goes too far and he, he goes, does, says things on Twitter that hurt him. I don't think this is one of those cases. I think the president, put yourself in his shoes. If you know you did not collude, but you're under an FBI investigation, of course you're gonna to wanna to speak out, you're gonna lash out, even if you're the president of the United States. And there is a policy objective here, and the president should be free, whether you like it or not, to pursue foreign policies. But the FBI has effectively tied Donald Trump's hands when it comes to how to deal with Russia until this probe is complete. And that's a foreign policy problem that the United States has. Mm -hmm. The FBI needs to finish its work. The Mueller report needs to get completed. I still have faith in Bob Mueller, the individual, although I've lost a lot of faith in his staff. But I do believe Bob Mueller is a man of integrity. This probe should come to a conclusion. And you've said that we all along. all deserve along. to know what the FBI has found and go public. Yeah. And I still believe it because I believe in Bob Mueller, the man. I know him, and I do think he will hold this group that that he unwisely put together you know for the american people sure they see it they see it's taking a, a lot of time and it's requiring a lot of patience um from all of us ari fleischer it is good to see you and great to start out the new year with you thank you well thanks sandra happy new year again all right. all right well what does president trump actually think about elizabeth warren running for president well, I actually think she's a hopeless case. I call her Pocahontas, and that's an insult to Pocahontas. Ah, but wait until you hear what we just found out about Pocahontas' plans for 2020, Carl Rove and Mark Thiessen, on whether or not her strategy just might work. The Iranian regime spends its people's wealth on spreading militancy and terror abroad rather than ensuring prosperity at home. We stand in total solidarity with the Iranian regime's longest suffering victims, its own people. Developing tonight, Iran gearing up for what could be a seventh day of protests. Today, Iran's supreme leader accusing the country's enemies, like the United States, for the violent clashes that have so far claimed more than 20 lives. The demonstrations began as a protest over Iran's beleaguered economy, but have since widened to a more general expression of anger over alleged government corruption and leadership. President Trump tweeting in support of the protesters today, saying, quote, Many reports of peaceful protests by Iranian citizens fed up with regime's corruption and its squandering of the nation's wealth to fund terrorism abroad. Iranian government should respect their people's rights, including right to express themselves. The world is watching. Here now, retired Staff Sergeant Robert Bartlett, an Iraq combat veteran who was badly injured when his convoy hit an Iranian bomb and can speak to how horrific that regime has become. Sergeant, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Sandra. You can obviously, obviously talk to us specifically about, about how that regime so badly impacted your own life. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, I, I joined Yuani and Vets Against the Deal uh, to try to stop them from getting the nuclear bomb a long time ago. And I'm still on that mission today. Uh, you know, when they got the blood of 500 Americans just in the last few years on their hands, uh, you know, that they've been killing Americans since the 1970s, and, and we just have, uh, we just really haven't done a whole lot of, uh, really about it. And you've been against that, that deal with Iran fr from go. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, it paved the way for a lot of things, uh, you know, the billions of dollars and, um, and money to go over. That obviously is 
not going to the people and you're seeing the protests now. Um, and then all of a sudden you see, uh, which is kind of funny, you see another uh, rogue regime like North Korea uh, all of a sudden getting a supercharged uh, nuclear program. So you're wondering where that untraceable money is really going. You know, when we talk to you and see how deeply affected you are um, by the Iranian regime, it, it makes you wonder just, you know, we can talk about the politics all day long and talk about the strategy. Of course, that is important. But, but one might wonder how it makes you feel to hear President Trump say, the world is watching and actually back the Iranian people in these protests. It's wonderful. I, I went to school with Iranians, uh, American Iranians, great guys. Uh, you know, um, there's plenty of good people in the world and in every country. The problem is bad regimes. We had a bad regime in uh, Iraq. We've had bad regimes in Afghanistan. And we've had a bad regime in a long, for a long time in Iran that we've been dealing with. They've been killing Americans. I've blood on their hands for years, since the 70s. So when you hear the president talk about this, and, and, and there are calls, you know, you've heard the politics today, um, saying we need to do more. It's one thing to say something. It's another thing to show how we're going to act. Lindsey Graham saying we need to lay out our strategy um, and how we're going to move forward here. You know, I'm just, just curious how all this, how, this is your mission in life now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you never know where you're going to end up. You start with a, you know, 30-year-old guy bartending. You know, you go to war because the war starts. You go to sniper school. You end up getting blown up. You spend four and a half years at Walter Reed. And then, uh, you know, you're getting involved in trying to stop uh, bad policies from happening and, and continue to save Americans on, on a policy level. You never know where you're going to end up. You just uh, you roll with the punches, as they say, you know. Sergeant Bartlett, it's an honor to speak with you tonight. Thank you for being here, well, and thank you for your service. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate it. We'll hear now General Jack Keane. He's the chairman of the Institute for the Study of War and a Fox News Senior st Strategic Analyst. General Keane, it is good to see you. And it is tough to, to hear you, his Sandra. story. And we, we've heard his story before. And every time he tells it, I, I learn something more about, about his mission now. And, and now as we see these, these protests there grow even more deadly, your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here with Sergeant Bartlett and the fact that he's still in the fight. And God bless him. God bless him for that. He's made a hell of a sacrifice, that's for sure. Yeah, well, I think this, when you compare this to 2009, we cannot help it. Certainly, uh, the way President Obama uh, acted then, I, I, was, I was embarrassed for the United States, uh, I think, the first time ever in my life. Uh, that we did not stand up and, and have moral clarity over the fact that there was a serious protest going on for the first time of any consequence against the Iranian regime. This one, I think, is a little, it cuts a little deeper because that one was about an election that people believe was stolen. This, this demonstration, while not as massive in Tehran, it's in 80 cities, Sandra, and it cuts across the, the entire social economic fabric of the country because unemployment's at 12 percent, inflation is high, that touches everybody's everybody's pocketbook there's been so many false promises about what they were going to do when they got sanction relief they got the money they got a ton of money over a hundred billion dollars and most of that as documented by our intelligence agencies has gone to fund the war in Syria in other words the Hezbollah the war in Iraq in other words the Shia militia and the war in Yemen the Houthis all of which the Iranians are are backing that is where their money is primarily going and their people People, their, their well-being of the people are paying a heck of a price for it, and they're in the streets absolutely getting the attention. And the other thing I've noticed that's different is they are really attacking the president of the country for failing them in Rouhani and also attacking the supreme leader. And I think the degree that that's going on is a bit unusual. You know, and it's, it's such an important distinction, and one I heard Ambassador Bol John Bolton make uh, earlier today as well. You look back at the protests in 2009 that was post-election. They were protesting the election. This is much different as a process of the actual regime. Susan Rice says the best thing that President Trump can do is stay quiet. President Trump is making it very clear he is not staying quiet here. Uh, how important is it that he, that he lay out a specific strategy, which he is often um, reluctant to do? Well, first of all, 
providing moral clarity, much as Ronald Reagan did, uh, to stand up against communism, particularly when the Poles were, were rebelling and protesting against the communist regime in Poland, uh, it can be very inspirational to the people on the ground. And I talked to Les Walenza personally about this, and he was quite emotional in describing the impact it had on him. But yes, I, I really think that we have to get the other countries of the world uh, to work with us on this. And I, I understand that communique is being put together with the UK, France, Italy, and, and possibly Germany as well. That's a step in the right direction. Uh, Nikki Haley today spoke about a Security Council meeting. Condemnation by the, by the world for what they're doing is, is very important, and it's one of the useful things that, uh, that the UN can actually do on a positive positive way. But then I think you got to get a con considerably more specific. And, and that is with the leaders themselves and, and their radicals who are, who their secret service who impose their will. This is the Iranian Republican Guards Corps and the Quds Force, the leaders of those organizations. They should be sanctioned. We should call them out, for, you know, for what they're doing. And then revisit their comprehensive strategy mm -hmm. against Iran and how we're going to stand up against this regime with our allies. We're not in this by ourselves, and, and, we, and we've got to push back hard on it. And, and, and we're not in this by ourselves when it comes to North Korea either, General Keene. And as we begin a new year, that threat is growing. Kim Jong-un um, making it very clear he is ready to act. Uh, as that threat continues to grow, you have to wonder what 2018 holds. Well, it's likely the showdown year, given uh, the director of the CIA has said they're months away from achieving this capability in his judgment. He said that, you know, publicly. So we're coming, this thing is coming to a head, and, and we're relying on China to accomplish the major diplomatic and economic sanction effort here. I, I doubt seriously if they're stepping up to the fullest that our government wants them to do, and, and I'm sure we're putting more pressure on them. But we're getting closer and closer to the potential of a, of a horrible situation, certainly, with, with some kind of military option uh, being exercised because the Trump administration, rightfully so, is not going to permit uh, North Korea to have intercontinental ballistic missiles pointed at, at American cities. And then once he miniaturizes those, uh, that capability, sell that to terrorists around, around the world and to his proxies. That's, that's the second stage of this thing and why it's so unacceptable. A lot on the president's plate as we start the new year. Uh, thanks for covering all that for us. General Keene, good to see you. Good always talking to you, Sandra. All right, you too. Well, today, Utah Senator Orrin Hatch announced his retirement. But was it just to make way for Senator Mitt Romney? Carl Rove and Mark Thiessen join me next. And one of them says this is a great idea. Then, from the network that's begging its critics, please stop calling us fake news. And, uh, I came prepared, you know, this year. I thought maybe I would bring a gas mask with me so I wouldn't, you know, get that contact high. But look at what's on the other end of the gas mask. Yes, a bong. Al Franken makes it official, formally resigning from the United States Senate today. It comes nearly a month after he announced plans to leave following a series of sexual misconduct allegations. His replacement is Minnesota's Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith. She'll be sworn in tomorrow. A special election to fill the remainder of Franken's term is slated for later this year. Former Republican Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, a conservative favorite, has hinted she is considering running for the seat. I have a feeling that in the next election, you could be swamped with candidates, but you're not going to be wasting your time. You'll have plenty of those Democrats coming over, and you're going to say, no, sir, no, thank you. No, ma'am, perhaps, ma'am. It may be Pocahontas. Well, that was President Trump more than eight months ago, predicting Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren may run for president in 2020. And now it appears that just might be the case, with reports suggesting she has made a series of important moves that could position her for a run against her nemesis, President Trump. Carl Rove is founder and advisor to American Crossroads. Mark Thiessen is an American Enterprise Institute scholar. Both men served under President George W. Bush and are Fox News contributors. And every time we showed you guys during those teases, you were laughing and having fun, <laughs> you know. So let's keep this going. So Senator Warren, Mark Thiessen, is this, yep. this going to happen? 
Uh, it's entirely possible. I mean, look, I think the nomination is Bernie Sanders as if he wants it. Uh, the Clinton machine is dead. It's his party now. And so if he wants this nomination, they're going to have to rest, wrestle it from him. And look, he's a year younger than uh, Joe Biden, who everyone's talking about as a serious candidate. So he's not too old if he wants to do it. Um, but if, so she won't get into the race if he does. But if he doesn't get into the race, then I think she is, quite frankly, the heir apparent to the to the Sanders movement. Um, and I think she would uh, she would take it to take the uh, she would be a real contender for the nomination. Uh, she's a little bit different uh, from from Bernie Sanders in the sense that she's not a Democratic Socialist. Until, until the 1990s, she was a registered Republican in the state of Massachusetts. She says she believes in markets and she believes that the Republican she left the Republican Party, she says, because the Republican Party abandoned markets and got into bed with big government and big business to rig the system against the little guy. That sounds a lot like Donald Trump. Uh, so it would be a very fascinating clash of uh, of, of populism. Enter Carl Rove. Rove. Your thoughts. <laughs> Uh, I agree. Uh, I, the minor disagreement I have with Mark is that I think that she may say those things, but I don't think she believes those things. If you look at her sure. legislative career, she may not run as a Democratic Socialist like Bernie Sanders does in Vermont, but she is a Democratic Socialist in her behavior in Congress and in the things she espouses. But I think he's got it absolutely right. Bernie Sanders represents that sort of uh, populist wing of the Democratic Party. If he runs, he represents All that right, wing. So you both agree run, she, she could she run. Could. It's, it's a good possibility she Absolutely. could run. But can she win, Karl Rove? Well, I, the, the, look, the general election is several geological ages away, and I think it all depends <laughs> upon, it, it, it all depends upon, you know, it, it, where is Donald Trump's uh, favorable rating if he does run? If it's at 35 to 38 where it is today, then she's got a shot at it. If he is either not in the race or he improves his favorable rating so it's up in the 40s uh maybe 45 or 50 yeah he, then then he can beat her but uh, it, it's a long way between now come and then. on and carl look, you and i so both know it's right around the corner there. who knows you know so if it's not her say it's not mm -hmm. her although you're both telling me it's the likely situation that she could run if it's not who who else mark Thiessen, who's Who's on the bench? Well, you've got you've got, uh, you've got uh, candidates like uh, like uh, uh, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, and Deval Patrick, uh, who are all out there, and they would have the advantage of being both articulate uh, sp uh, speakers, but also uh, they would be able to uh, they would be arguably because they're African Americans, they would appeal to the, the to the African American community and bring out that that Obama coalition. I think the sort of the dark horse uh, fr front runner would be Sherrod Brown of Ohio. If Sherrod Brown wins his reelection. Uh, in 2018, he's a he's a progressive populist from from a uh, from a key state in Ohio uh, who knows how to who championed the the white working class that abandoned who did, who voted for Barack Obama mm -hmm. twice and switched to Donald Trump in 2016. The key for the Democrats to win in 2016 is to find the candidate who can win the, back those Obama Trump voters. There are millions of them. There there are hundreds of counties that voted twice for Barack Obama and then switched to Donald Trump. If they if they have any chance of winning. Uh, that election. They've got to find somebody who can appeal to them, and it might be All somebody right. like Sherrod Brown. So you don't have to look far to see Mitt Romney in the headlines right now. Carl Rove. Orrin Hatch announces his retirement, and shortly after, Mitt Romney issues a statement congratulating him, and everybody says, okay, so is it, uh, it going to be Mitt Romney? Well, Romney is very popular in Utah because uh, of the family's long association in the state and his uh, personal involvement in the Olympics lives in uh, Park City outside of uh, outside of Salt Lake. And so, yeah, if he decides to run, he is he, he is a very popular figure. There'll be he'll have he'll be challenged for the nomination if he if uh, if he does run. But my sense is, is that he'd be enormously popular. The church, the LDS church would be largely behind him. And uh, the stature that he would bring to the Senate would cause a lot of Utahns to come out and support him both in the primary and the general election. Ah, but the big question mark, would he align <laughs> with Donald Trump? Yeah, I thought. I, well, well look, you know, I think I think he would be, but I think uh, it would. In order for Mitt Romney to lose, we'd have to get Steve Bannon to find another alleged sex predator to to run against him, because that's the only way you're going to lose the state of uh, of Utah to to the Democrats. Uh, so I think I think Mitt Romney w w is is very much the likely nominee, and uh, I think it's a good it's good that uh, that Orrin Hatch decided to step down. He just look, he's had he's been in Washington since 1977. Uh, he just passed the first tax reform in three decades. He Appeal the Obama individual mandate, uh, and so it's. Yeah, I think it's time for him to step aside and uh, and uh, and call it a career and, and make way for somebody. Carl, like Carl, it seems like you were trying to jump back in there. Well, look, I, I, I do think that uh, 
Mitt Romney's an adult, so I think if he were to be elected to the Senate, he would find ways to cooperate with the president when sure. they agreed, and if they had disagreements, he'd be respectful about it. Mm -hmm. And and like like Mark, I'm, look, I, be, I was involved in, in, in Orrin Hatch's 1988 campaign as a youngster, known him a long time. He's a wonderful human being. I'm glad Agreed. he's going out on a high. He exactly. has passed this major tax reform legislation. He's got a lot of other accomplishments under his belt. He has done a magnificent job for the country and for the state of Utah, and I'm glad he's going out on a high note. I, don't, I can already picture a lot of the words that Mitt Romney, choice words Mitt Romney had for Donald Trump back then that would then come up, right, Mark? Oh, absolutely. I mean, but uh, the, I mean, the reality is, I think Donald Trump is probably going to have to go out and support him because he's going to be the nominee. And mm -hmm. the the presumption is to work together. I don't think I don't think Mitt Romney is going to be going to Washington to stop tax reform, to stop uh, you know the growing economy and getting the economy moving again and undermine the Trump presidency. Uh, he's going to be going there to get conservative things accomplished. And and you know right. even the senators that Donald Trump hates the most, like Jeff Flake and and Dean Heller, vote with him 95, 96, right. 96 seven percent of the Good time point. and I think Mitt Romney would vote with him 96 97 percent of the time Mark and Carl happy new year good to see both of you same Thanks. to you happy new year All right well up next the most trusted name in news rings in the new year with a bong plus NBC announces Matt Lauer's replacement but their choice is raising one pretty uncomfortable question Molly Hemingway and Richard Fowler on where the media is headed in 2018 when we come back Now, I came prepared, you know, this year. I thought maybe I would bring a gas mask with me so I wouldn't, you know, get that contact high. But look at what's on the other end of the gas mask. Yes, a bong. Uh, just doesn't get old, does it? They didn't teach that in journalism school, did they? CNN taking some heat for its live report on board the Canna bus this New Year's Eve. Joining me now, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, and Richard Fowler, nationally syndicated radio talk show host. Both are Fox News contributors. Molly what did you think of that moment the other night? Well, I am from Colorado, where we do have legal weed. But you know, there, I think there, it's totally OK to have fun on New Year's and be goofy and lighthearted, although there is what? a difference between Would you be OK a, with children seeing that? Well, it's not just that. I mean, that that's actually just one of many things that was happening that night on CNN with a lot of drunken behavior and revelry. Well, and that also, makes it OK, then. <laughs> no, it, it, I'm saying it was it was sort of problematic across yeah. the board. And also, it's so inconsistent for CNN. I mean, a couple months ago, they banned someone from appearing on the network because he said that there were two things that had never let him down, boobs and the First Amendment. And this mm. host, Brooke Baldwin, said that she was aghast and she couldn't believe it was said. And then on New Year's Eve night, she's making all these double on Andre mm. jokes about about similar things and it's like you have to be consistent you can't act like you're so offended by this rhetoric and then have a New Year's Eve special like this Richard what do you have to say about this number one our New Year's show was better because ah, um, I was in it, you were in it. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Uh, number two uh, I actually tend to agree with Molly on this one and the reason being is that I do believe that we should legalize marijuana for the all the positive reasons number one uh, it, it it's a cost savings in Colorado. They have a budget surplus thanks to the tax that are collected because of legalization marijuana. Hold on, hold marijuana. on, hold on. You're getting away from the conversation. No, no, here. I'm getting. No, I'm, I'm I mean, getting. I there was a visibly uncomfortable Anderson no, Cooper well, looking on. I, I, no, but, and that's the point I'm making. I think when you when you do these type of segments where you novelize it and you sort of make it kooky and funny, you get away from the actual benefits and talking about the benefits of legalizing it, and you get right. into this sort of morality where people are aghast by the fact that CNN oh, made this funny segment boy, instead of actually talking about the benefits of legalizing. All right. So um, moving on to another big news story, Hoda Kopp is now the new host, co-host of the Today Show with Savannah Guthrie, an all-female um, Today Show hosting panel there, all women, Molly. Yeah, and I mean, I think in this case, Hoda Kotb, Kotb how we say her name, um, was chosen because she's a very beloved person on the network and they needed someone they you know this is kind of a new trend is to go in-house to replace talent and whatnot but also they had you know they had reason to have a problem with Matt Lauer and they probably wanted a fresh female face there to not remind viewers of his many troubles you know it, it's an interesting move I, I think five years ago even I mean, looking back several years ago Richard you would have assumed that that position would have been filled with a man um, but it was not. What does that tell us? I mean, I think that's right. If anything. And I, and I think there was a lot of speculation that there was a couple of men in line to get that role, and they ended up chosen going in-house and having an all-female cast. I mean, she is accompanied by Al Roker, 
uh, and Carson Daly, uh, Carson, I think it's Carson, I don't remember his last name. Carson Daly. Carson Daly, there we go, I got it right, almost got it right the first time there. Uh, and so I think that there is a benefit to having an all-female cast. I think this brings some diversity to the morning lineup where there's usually one man and two women. Now you have two women sort of teeing off the table. But I think it speaks to the fact that I think, you know, for this sort of breaks the barriers, right, that you can have an all-female cast lead a show. Uh, I think, you know, Fox did it first without Numbered. Certainly. Uh, <laughs> Hello. But we do bring on a man in the middle every day, our one lucky guy. But, uh, but you know, I think it's... It was you today, right? It was me today. I've uh, been working hard, just <laughs> along, with you, uh, along with you, Sandra. Uh, but I, I think it does speak to the fact that, you know, the, the, the network is trying to really um, sort of take away the stain of Mel Hour. Interesting, Molly, that um, Hoda Kapi, I believe, she weighed in and said that she did receive a congratulatory text from Matt Lauer afterward. So. Well, should we leave it there? He's <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> All right, we'll see what the big news story is going to be of 2018. That's for sure. Happy New Year to you both. Thanks for being here. Thanks. And Richard, get some sleep tonight. I will. We will be right back. Just wanted to bring this to your attention. A look at Twitter this evening as we look at Mitt Romney's Twitter page after our discussion about Warren Hatch, the Utah senator, announcing his retirement, possibly paving the way for Mitt Romney. It appears right after his announcement that Mitt Romney went on his Twitter account and changed his location to Holiday, Utah from Massachusetts. Something we as observed and thought we would share with you. All right. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the story tonight. It was great to be with you. We will see you back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. You can also catch me every weekday at 9 on America's Newsroom and again at noon on Outnumbered. Tucker is up next. <laughs>